People v. Wright. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Chelsea Lopez on behalf of Freddie T. Wright. May I reserve three minutes for rebuttal? Three. Three minutes, yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, so even one peremptory challenge based on race violates Batson, and in this case, we have two. Um, by the second round of jury selection, all three African-American panelists were removed from serving on Mr. Wright, a black man's jury. This is troubling. Starting with CC, he was a black man who very clearly said his cousin, who had been arrested about 15 years ago for marijuana possession, would not affect his ability to be fair and impartial juror in this case. When the prosecutor decided to single him out and question him, and in her own words, pick on CC, the black man, she decided to ask him about this, this um, his cousin's arrest. He confirmed at that time that he had no prejudgments towards police. He confirmed that he'd be able to listen to police testimony before making any conclusions. He was a suitable juror in this case. He also said that testimonial evidence would be enough. And yet the prosecutor removed him from serving on the jury for three reasons, three pretextual reasons. One, he had cousins who had been arrested. Two, she uh, apparently- I, I, I'm page, um, I, I don't know the exact page, but during the questioning of CC, the people say, so you have a negative feeling about how the police got there and their approach and going inside. And he says, well, yeah, the way, just the fact that they took everybody. Uh, I didn't know that they had to take everybody, but that was it. You don't think that that's a reason for the prosecution to think that maybe that his feelings toward the police as a result of that incident might cause him to view the evidence in a way um, that is affected by that? Uh, no, for two reasons. Um, one, he only said that after she kept pushing him and she put those words basically in his mouth by saying, so you don't have negative feelings about the police and all he says is that he only has a, a negative feeling after repeatedly being asked about the way he treated his grandma in the situation. He never said I have a problem with police in generally and then when she followed up and asked, um, do you have any negative feelings? Uh, from the police, from that incident with your family, that may make it so when those police officers testify, you may have a prejudgment about them. Not at all. She presses him again, and she says, "Can you listen to that police?" That goes, it seems to me, to whether they're qualified to be jurors and could be stricken. The juror could be stricken for cause. We we are looking for support in the record for the judge's determination that this was not pretextual. And as I understand that whole series of answers. That was raised by CC in response to a question, do you have relatives who were victims of crimes? And he says, yeah, I had these cousins or whatever who were arrested for marijuana charges, right? So he act, it was actually in response to whether you're a victim of a crime, this is on appendix page 130, 193, or if you've witnessed a crime. Um, so no, it wasn't just being a victim of a crime, and also this court's analysis of the step two reasons should so he was me, he, meant he witnessed them smoking marijuana. Is that why you think he raised it in response to that question? No. So what happened was that his cousin had been arrested for marijuana possession 15 years ago. But generally, this court's analysis should not be on whether he had these what the respondent calls lingering negative feelings, because that's not the reason that was given at step two. And we should be careful because what's being asked of it is what's the subjective intent of the trial prosecutor at the time. Right, so we provide a lot of deference to the trial court in determining that, right? And our review standard is, is there support in the record for the court's conclusion that this was not contextual? And well, I think then we can look at the record to see what was surrounding that those answers that were problematic to the prosecutor. So in Hecker, this court made clear that your review power is limited to the examination of pretext determination in light of the reasons placed on the record. In this case, it was a reverse Batson, so by defense counsel, but the reasons placed on the record by the non-movement. And here, all she said was he had cousins who had been arrested. This was pretextual because it applied to other jurors that she chose not to single out. Uneven questioning is um, proof of pretext of um, discriminatory. But those jurors didn't raise those issues in response to that question. As I read the record on that question, the responses all talked about victims of crimes, and this juror raises, I had relatives who were arrested. Well, that's her reason, right? Her reason is he had cousins who had been arrested. And CC, yeah, he had a cousin who had been arrested 15 years ago for marijuana yeah, possession. Presume but the judge is also 
familiar with the record in that exchange, right? And it's really the judge's determination that we're reviewing of that reason and whether that reason is protectual given the record here. Correct. So given the record, it's not supported um, because there are other panelists who had friends or family members that are arrested. Based on the record, we know that there is a non-African American panelist whose younger brother was not only arrested but convicted of robbery, um, which is the case that the what Mr. Wright was charged for in this case, and yet the prosecutor didn't. But that wasn't the up. only reason that was given that they had a family member who was arrested, right? As, no, as but I recall the record uh, regarding Cece, there were four uh, issues a family member arrested, renter, unmarried, no children. And were any other jurors who have those four criteria? Yes. Based on the jury? So those are also, they're all pretextual reasons. Um, the I'm saying, is, was there anyone else who had that? The conglomeration of those yes, four two factors. seated jurors, and we know one of them, juror seven, is not African American, and yet they weren't struck. So again, it's uneven application of this criteria, and it couldn't be a strategy because for those three um, criteria, renting in an expensive place like New York City, being unmarried and having no children, factually irrelevant to the facts of the case or an ability to serve, nor did the prosecutor provide any conceivable relationship between those factors and being a jury in this case. Counsel, I'd like to go back for one second to the statement by CC that he had negative feelings towards the police, which I, I understand you to say, and I believe you're right, that that wasn't argued as a non-protectual uh, reason when, it, when a justification was asked for. But is it your testimony, having said that and, and being part of the record of what happened, um, that the court was not entitled or permitted to even consider that statement in determining whether or not uh, you know non non-protectual reasons had been given yes because that wasn't a reason provided at step two we are looking at the trial prosecutor's subjective intent at the time it was given and just um, this just wasn't a reason given, and the reasons that were given are pretextual. And because at step two, the prosecutor gave a whole laundry list of reasons that are unevenly applied or unsupported by the record. I'm, I'm, I'm having a little difficulty squaring that with this idea of deference being made to the, to the determination of the court as to whether or not the reasons given were non-protectual, because it seems as if you're asking for the court to willfully disregard something I mean, yes, that, that, that statement would be great to use in a four-cause challenge, but I also think it could be very animating towards the prosecutor's decision to strike the juror peremptorily if you don't get a cause challenge. Um, so I, it seems to me as if you're, it artificially limits the universe of available information for the court to use in deciding whether or not the uh, reasons are non-protectual. I'm just asking this court to apply um, the analysis that it's done in Hecker, which is to look at the step two reasons provided and see if there's record support for it. But do they have to list every nuance of that reason? If it's this exchange over victims, do they have to then say that he said they just raided the house and took them all out, they barged in, that he changed his story later and said he wasn't actually there? Do they have to list all those sub-reasons in the record for the overall he this issue of victim of crime they have to do each of those things prosecutor? for us to be able to yeah. find support in the record yes the prosecutor has to clearly state their step two reasons that's what this court and the supreme court and to that degree of specificity yes because in miller l the supreme court clearly stated a non-movement must stand or fall on the plausibility of the reasons provided at step two our current but, but, batson but, 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 if, if the prosecutor had, the prosecutor didn't hear say this, but the prosecutor had said there was an exchange in which the uh, juror said that he harbored negative uh, feelings towards the police. Wouldn't that be enough to bring in the, the colloquy about that? Do, are you really saying he needs to recite, the, or she in this case, needs to recite the entire colloquy to preserve it? Um, Yes, because we're looking at the subjective intent right, but, but of the, the prosecutor. Right, but the prosecutor says, the prosecutor says the reason, so you're going after the prosecutor's subjective intent, I take your point. The reason is because this juror, potential juror said he still harbors negative views towards the police. Isn't that enough? But he Can't didn't, we then just look at the record to see if there's support for that? No, just 
based on this analysis, it has to be the step two reasons. It's a subjective intent. And basically, well, if we- with respect to, you're saying it's uneven. With respect to the non-minority um, jurors that were selected and seated, did they respond um, in a way indicating that they had some negative or hurt feelings with respect to the police, um, the uh, relative convictions, et cetera? No, but it's because- but Doesn't that matter? It doesn't, it doesn't matter because it's the reasons that are provided. And if there was a reason to now, we can now look at the record and conjure up new reasons to remove CC, no, that's just inappropriate. but if you aren't, if there is an interaction and the juror says, I had relatives, there was an arrest, happened a long time ago, and that's it, it's over and done with. That is one thing, but if they express some concerns or negative feelings, are you saying that is not relevant? Um, it's not relevant to this court. It's under the current Batson framework of looking at the subjective intent, and we should really scrutinize what the reasons are provided. It is so easier, easy to think of new reasons now that we've this sat with the I record. think to the Chief Judge's point, it's not a new reason. It's how specific do you have to be in giving your reason. So if, let's say, the prosecutor had said here, you know, the job this person has, I really think they harbor, you know, um, a, a bias, they may be sympathetic. And then later, we try to look at the record and say, but look at this answer they gave to the victim question where they talk about relatives being arrested for marijuana. I think you clearly can't do that. But where you give a more general answer uh, in terms of what your reason is, but specific enough, do you really have to get into the nuances of the back and forth of what was said, or can we see, because the judges obviously heard that colloquy, if it supports that view? Under the current Batson framework, no, it has to be specific to the reasons that are provided, especially where CC unequivocally and clearly says that he would not, um, has no prejudgments towards police in general. Counsel, if, if we didn't agree with that, just go with me for a minute, hypothetically, if it was fair game, if it was a reasonable inference, for example, that what he said would make him a juror that the people didn't want for a non-discriminatory reason, namely, maybe he harbors hostility. If we could reach that, would you agree then that it was non-protectual? No, because there were other pretextual reasons provided. So even if there, she should have made a four-cause challenge if she believed this to be true, but she didn't. But because there were reasons that provided, especially the one about having a note that she had other, other friends involved in multiple arrests, the respondent concedes that this doesn't exist, and not once but twice misstating the record. To remove two African-American panelists is extremely concerning in a Batson analysis. So, so do you have to have a non-pretextual reason Right, at, 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 step, at step two, it does have to be the only reason? Like what if it's mixed? What if there's mixed reasons? Then even if, it's, uh, even if there's one reason that's pretextual and one reason that's not, I would, I would, I would, this court should find a Batson violation because peremptory challenge is based on race, even if it's a little bit based on race or a lot of bit based on race, Batson needs to Do you have a case have, that says that? Uh, I don't, uh, but I do, but, but based on the totality of the facts and circumstances is what this court's consideration is, so um, I think that fits squarely in that is when you look at What the, about Casey? Casey. Casey, she was an African-American African woman who was also a suitable juror. She said that she worked for the Department of Probation. She aligned herself as a member of law enforcement. And she didn't describe her employment as being this sympathy, diverting juveniles. However, and it was relevant that her job did involve supervising and interacting with juvenile. She but actually described her employment as evidence-based, which would make her a great juror because that's what jurors roles However, are. However, the reality is there is police officers outside arresting people and their supervision and how one would supervise a juvenile offender versus a, versus arresting adults that's not exactly the same it 
whether different minds can can um, think of Casey as a more similar to a police officer or not, it doesn't. I think the strongest evidence Let here. Let me was try that, it this way: mm -hmm. as a probation officer, the person is put on probation. Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of probation to you? The purpose of probation is to essentially still punish someone for something they did. It's not to supervise and make sure that they could <clears throat> take part of the, the measures to avoid them continuing on in a path that rehabilitation that has no relevant factor. Well, it's not. Well, not here. There's no children involved. Um, Mr. Wright is an adult man. There's no children witnesses. With family with teachers. Prosecutors have struck jurors, potential jurors, because they're teachers, because they're social workers. They've given a reason as a concern, not that, not that it would rise to a level for cause. You're saying that can't be done here. Maybe. I don't know the facts of that record or what the voir dire looks like, but here she said that she never said sympathy plays a role in her employment. And it's also concerning this strike because, again, the prosecutor claims she never asked her any Do questions about it. Do you recognize that a prosecutor or defense attorney can reject a characterization given in response to questioning and still, and, and not, as a result, not accept that juror? Do you believe that? I believe that if that's what okay. the prosecutor said, but she didn't. She said, I believe I don't question, I didn't question her about this and thinks that sympathy might play a role, but she I, I did. don't think that was the question, though. If, if she affirmatively said that she thinks of herself, Casey, as, as a law enforcement, you don't think that the prosecutor is entitled to reject that self-assessment without even saying so? To just say, no, I, I don't think she, you're anything like law enforcement. Uh, the prosecutor could think that, uh, but that's not the re the reason was that she believed I certainly um, She said even though I didn't question her on it, and I don't have grounds for cause for these reasons I do think that sympathy might come into play for her based on her line of work not based on her answers Just based on her line of work, but here she said that her line of work was evidence-based not sympathy based um, and she also was but, but clearly evidence, asked. Is evidence based sort of a term of art in psychology? Um, I don't know. Okay. But, but, but she, maybe the prosecutor knows? Um, well, the pro I think what's relevant is the prosecutor asked on uh, appendix page 415 is so your sympathy won't play a role for you here. And then she says, same for you, Miss uh, Cece. Not a problem. We follow evidence based practice clearly refuting that sympathy plays any role in her, in her daily job duties. I'm not so sure about that, right? And plus, the other thing, it seems like your argument is that for the purpose of peremptory strikes, if a potential juror says, I can be unbiased, uh, they, that has to be taken at face value. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, if there's nothing else to refute that they're not going to be biased, and here she would... Well, yes. The peremptory is a, is a strike you can use for sort of any reason as long as it's not racially discriminatory or gender based or so on, right? Yes. Protected classification. Mm -hmm. And here we know it's protectural based because all of the reasons that were provided for either CC or Casey were either factually inaccurate or unevenly applied to other jurors. And so under the current Batson framework, um, both of these were pretextual. Can I ask you something about what the judge said? It's at A360, and it, he said it a number of times, and it, it sort of bothered me. Um, this is the quote. It said, as to prima facie case, it, he said, what factor of inferences established the prima facie case that your adversary has ex excluded jurors, and he said this several times, solely on account of the membership in that group? So it looked to me like the judge was saying, you could have a racially discriminatory reason, but as long as it's not your sole reason, it's okay. Is that what the judge is saying here, or is that? In other words, you can have mixed reasons, and if you have mixed reasons, it's still no good if one of them is racially discriminatory. Is that right? I would agree that if even one of those reasons is based on race, it should violate Batson. May it please the court. Good afternoon, your honors. 
For the respondent, Assistant District Attorney Danielle O'Boyle from the office of Melinda Katz. As this court made clear in Hecker, and as several of your honors have noted today, this third step of the Batson inquiry is a pure issue of fact. So this court's review is limited as to whether, limited to whether there is any record basis for the trial court's finding. So with respect to the record and the facts here, was there a difference in what was the criteria for allowing a non-white juror to sit versus a juror of color? Uh, no, Your Honor, because the defense cannot point to any juror. We'll talk, start with K, uh, CC, I'm sorry. Any juror who was similarly situated to CC. What about the ones who had relatives con actually convicted of crimes? Well, Your Honor, preservation is actually relevant to your point there. Here, by the time the Batson challenge happens with respect to CC, 32 jurors have been questioned, two different panels of 16. And a lot of the information as to who had relatives that had been arrested or convicted or other interactions with law enforcement, those answers were given in response to questions by the judge. And it's not actually clear which jurors they correspond to. We only really get that clarity when either the prosecution or the defense follows up with those jurors. So when the defense makes the challenge and says, well, there are other people that meet those criteria that are non-African American, he says there are crime victims and people who have rented. First of all, CC did not identify as a crime victim. He identified as someone who had relatives who had uh, a negative experience with police who had been arrested. So to say that there are similarly situated jurors one, we don't have the record really to we support do have, we that. Do have a, we do have a record as to certain of the jurors, that, that their race, right, and as to whether they have relatives who were uh, who convicted of crimes, right? We have that. Absolutely, Your Honor. But okay. uh, in that regard, I think the two critical jurors to look at are CC and KL, because both of those were in that second round. I'm sorry, Why the first round. Why does it have to be in the same round? I mean, isn't it, it almost universally across jurisdictions, the rule is that the Batson challenge is timely as long as it's made before the jury is seated? Absolutely, Your Honor. And, and I apologize if I was unclear. It's not that they were in the same round. It's just helpful to look at the analysis of those two jurors well, and so the questioning. I, I mean, I, I, maybe I misunderstood you. Maybe I misunderstood your papers as well. I thought you were making a point that unless you made an objection right in the, at the time that a particular panel was there, it was not preserved. You, you started out saying something about preservation. Uh, no, Your Honor, that, that would not be our position, but just that the okay. defense would have to certainly assert with sufficient specificity as to which jurors are being uh, alleged to be similarly situated. That could be in either of the first two panels. CC is in the first panel, and the Batson challenge is made during the, the well, second round. It could be round. made as regard to the third panel. Even, Absolutely. Right? Okay. It's just a matter of alleging with su sufficient specificity which jurors you're challenging so that the prosecutor could meaningfully respond to that. Well, they the did identify which jurors they're challenging, which is with specificity. They did that. Yes, Your Honor, but in terms of saying, well, that juror is similarly situated to others with these vague assertions, that doesn't allow the prosecutor a meaningful opportunity to respond as to well, why she well, elected to not challenge those. Why not? Those. I mean, they're both there. They both have the record. Absolutely, Your Honor, and certainly the court had that full record before it, but right. at they, the time... the prosecutor could say, no, actually, there's no jurors here who have relatives who are convicted of a crime. Correct, Your Honor, but that, that would not have been accurate here. Certainly there right. were jurors, Which is right? Straight. But the and defense everybody has the, knows who those are. Yes, Your Honor, but the defense has the burden in two respects. The defense has the burden here to show at step three that the reasons were pretextual, and the defense has the burden to adequately preserve that record for appeal. And the defense failed in both of those respects. So while it may have been known that some of these jurors had other relatives who were convicted of crimes, the defendant never alleged who those were with sufficient specificity that we could actually tie other qualities even to them because that record is not made. But if, and, if, but if I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood you, but, but if they are all known, does it, is it necessary for the defense counsel to say all of those others who are comparable? And then you know it's all of them and you can just go through them as opposed to saying it's this prospective juror on that panel and so forth. Well, Your Honor, he, if, he were, if the defense were to say all of, if we were to say all of them were known, we have to talk about which criteria. Are we saying one criteria, one or more? Because again, n our position is that no other juror was similarly situated it, to CC. It seems somewhat unfair compliment to what we were saying to your adversary that, mm -hmm. you know, you, we can go back and look in the record and say, you know, this, bat, this colloquy with this potential juror was different and, and, you know, you made a general objection, but it brings with it this record 
and then say, no, you have to be more specific on where we look in the record for comparable jurors. Uh, no, Your Honor, and there's a critical distinction there, because here, if you look at the prosecutor's reasons, admittedly, she does not bring up at the time she gives her reasons with respect to CC that he had negative feelings. But the trial court is not looking at that in a vacuum. And it's not only the colloquy that the prosecutor had with CC, but also that the court had. As Justice Garcia mentioned, at the time, the judge was actually inquiring about people who were crime victims or witnesses to crimes. And then CC offers this lengthy response. He's the first one to do that beyond just a brief statement about very clearly a negative experience that has had an impact so on him CC 15 years is later. being forthright in answering a question that the court put to him. Sometimes jurors don't immediately answer with respect to that issue, but later in response to something else, they will respond to, the, to a question that's related to more than one specific category. Absolutely, Your Honor. And the issue is not that he was not being forthright. It's that that colloquy, together with the questions, his answers to the questions that the prosecutor posed, show that he absolutely had negative feelings toward police officers, and he explicitly affirmed that in response to those questions. Negative feelings or concerns about the impact of the experience on people. Not, not that, it, because wasn't there some discussion about what the cousin or the relative that caused the police to put the grandmother in that situation in the first instance? Yes, Your Honor, but there are two different issues here, one being whether the juror could have been struck for cause and one whether it was appropriate for the prosecutor to use a peremptory challenge. And that's really why it's important to look at the distinction and the colloquies but with that CC. that is clear, but it's also relevant when you look at the overall circumstances. When you look at Flowers versus Mississippi, when the, it was over a course of a number of trials, the sole strategy of the prosecutor was to get rid of black jurors. So what she's saying is, looking at what had happened before, it makes it more suspect, so to speak, when you're saying certain criteria apply to this one, yet she points to other people who they believe were seated in spite of, not simply arrests or having people who had contact, but actual arrests and convictions. Wasn't someone convicted of a weapon who sat on the jury? Uh, yes, Your Honor, that was alternate number one, but it's that juror and juror number 10, SM, who the defense points to, and neither of them can be seen as similarly situated to CC, even if we're just looking at the... So even, so even though they had actual convictions themselves, that doesn't cause it to be suspect when um, she didn't have a conviction, there was relative who had contact 15 years earlier. And some of the others, their experiences were more recent in time. So you're saying you can't look at any of that? Of course, Your Honor, you can look at it. But actually, only one of them had the conviction. The seated juror number 10, uh, SM, she had the brother who had been arrested two years before for possession of stolen property. It was the alternate juror who had been prosecuted oh, previously. So two years, two years. That juror sat, someone has an experience, their relatives have an experience, and not even necessary within the close degree, and they can't sit from 15 years ago, and you don't see a different application of the criteria used. It's not the same, uh, it's not a different application, Your Honor, because at the time those jurors were questioned, juror number 10 and alternate number one, they actually expressly affirmed that they did not have negative feelings towards police officers. Alternate number one said she harbored no resentment. That is very different from KC, who had already given this lengthy colloquy about how the police raided his home. How he told that story was very telling, and that's actually all the more reason to give so deference to the trial court. So was if KC currently harbored ill feelings against the police? Yes, Your Honor. CC was asked if it was a present day question, if, if, that, uh, if he had negative feelings as he was seated there that day towards the police officers. And as Justice Singus pointed the out earlier. The answer was? Well, yeah. And he talks about how I didn't know why the police. The police overall or the police present at that time? I believe he says uh, police generally. Your Honor, and uh, as Justice Singus pointed out earlier, he then went on to say that they, they barged in the home. I didn't know why they had to take everyone. So 
those answers and the explicit affirmance that he currently harbored negative feelings absolutely so, distinguishes so what do CC. We, what do we do with the prosecutor's second reason, which is that uh, CC has friends and relatives who had multiple arrests, and there's zero support in the record for that? Uh, Your Honor, although that note seems to have been in error, no doubt. The, it's not fair to say that there would be no support in the record for that because even the trial court acknowledges that uh, there had been a number of people arrested in connection with his cousin's arrest. And again, this is another opportunity. But that was offered as, a, as an independent reason from the cousin. Yes, the, Your Honor. The incident with the cousin. Yes, Your Honor, but the court is not looking at these just as one-by-one one statements. The court is looking at the prosecutor's responses as a whole in connection with well, that well, colloquy. Wait. We're, we're try I think we're trying to decide whether the prosecutor gave, eventually we're trying to decide, is the prosecutor striking people based on racial animus? Yes, Your Fair? Honor. Correct. So how do, we, how do we deal with a situation where, and let's suppose you're right, just for the purpose of argument, that as to the first, She's got a non-protextual reason for striking the juror. Let's suppose for the second, she's got a racially biased reason for striking the juror. We would, we would then say you can't use the peremptory. Is that fair? Correct, Your Honor. So why aren't we looking at these explanations independently? Well, it's not that, I actually don't think you should look at them independently. I just think that you should, I think you should look at it as the totality of the well, evidence so, and record before the court. But that's sort of saying, I mean, this sort of goes to, to Justice Pritzker's question, right? Um, if, if a strike, if you give a couple of reasons, and one of those is a perfectly good reason for, for using a peremptory, and the other is a perfectly invalid reason, why, isn't, why are you looking at the totality? But, Your Honor, the second reason that we're talking about here, about this note, it's, I really don't think it's no, no, fair. No, no, right. I understand. I'm giving you a hypothetical at the beginning. I don't, sure. I don't think that the second is a concession that the prosecutor is operating in a, in a racially biased way. I'm trying to get at the methodology first. I think if there was a mix of racially motivated and non-racially motivated reasons, of course that would be uh, a basis for the court to have a finding, to make a finding of pretext. I don't then disagree with that. You're not really looking at the totality, right? One racially ba uh, biased explanation is sufficient to, to get you into a Batson trouble. Yes, Your Honor. If, if the court finds that that makes that challenge pretextual, yes. But right. everything would just have to be so factually specific because you do have to look at the full record before the trial court. And I go back to why that deference is so Wouldn't important. Wouldn't that depend, it seems to me, on what the reason is for the allegation that it's pretextual? So if you had three reasons, if you had reason A, and you say, okay, reason A is non-pretextual, and then you had B, C, D, and the reason the allegation is those are pretextual is other people have that and you didn't strike them, then it seems to me you can say, okay, but those come in combination with the non-pretextual reason, it's fine. If there's B, C, or D that uh, standing on its alone indicates it is a pretextual racially, cover, to cover racial animosity towards a juror, that would be bad. So it really depends on what the net, what the, problem with the other challenges is, doesn't it? Absolutely, Your Honor. That's why it would be so fact-specific and you have to look at it as a whole. So with that issue regarding the note, it's important to say that that wasn't the only reason given, right? And I think the court actually reconciles that, even though the defense never pointed it out at the time. The defense never said, oh, uh, CC never said that. He never said he had other friends in law enforcement. I think the court was able to reconcile that because he says, yes, a number of people at the house were arrested. So again, yet another reason to defer to the court there and to find that the court's finding that that is not protectual is appropriate. It's not something that came out of the blue. This is all happening very quickly. The prosecutor and the defense had 20 minutes in the first I round. I just need to clarify because I, I took this note and I'm not sure I've captured your response to the chief judge. Um, I wrote down that you said a, a mixed reason. That would be that part of the response is the judge would say is pretext, right? The other part of the response the judge would not find is pretext. Uh, that a mixed reason, a basis for a finding of pretext. That is that, did I get you right that you said that? I believe so, Your Honor, because it, you're not evaluating them one by one. You're looking at the challenge to that juror. So if you find that the prosecutor's reason or reasons are mm -hmm. pretextual on the whole, mm -hmm. and that could have been maybe when the prosecutor said the first reason, the court was not yet, the court was not convinced that it right. was pretextual. So if I'm understanding you, your, your position is that if 
mixed reasons are provided, what we're calling mixed reasons, let's just put it that way, that a judge could find pretext, but need not find pretext. Have I understood you? I think so, Your Honor, but it's a little bit difficult because when we're talking about mixed reasons, ultimately, at stage two, the prosecutor has to offer facially neutral reasons, and the prosecutor certainly did that here. Then at stage three, that's when the, the burden shifts to the defense to determine or to prove and let's establish just, let's that just there are... with it. The, the judge hears what the prosecutor has said and decides, and let's say the prosecutor gave two reasons. I'm going to make it simple. Two. One, the judge says, I think that that's pretext. The other is not. I think is it your position then that the judge could decide I, that therefore the that the judge will accept the peremptory challenge because no, there's a non-pretext reason? No, Your Honor. Okay. I think if the court were to find that in any way okay. the prosecutor improperly discriminated against a cognizable group, then the court's duty in evaluating that evidence at step three would be to find that that was an improper challenge. Okay. Counsel, uh, then, that the you. prima facie analysis that the court is making at A360 is incorrect because he's talking about uh, excluding juries solely on account of the membership in that group and you're disagreeing with that aren't you? Um, yes, Your wrong, Honor. Right? Yes, I, I think the court does uh, somewhat mischaracterize that, but overall the inquiry does happen as it's supposed to in this case, and the court does follow the three-step process. Your Honor, I see that my time has elapsed, but if I could just have leave to briefly address Juror Casey. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in this case, my opponent focuses on the fact that uh, in the defense's view, KC is a suitable juror. But again, I think this really blurs that distinction and the critical distinction between striking a juror for cause and exercising a peremptory challenge. And uh, the line of work that my opponent says was she characterized as evidence-based, before she got to any discussion of evidence-based, Casey says that she works as an intake probation officer dealing with juveniles, and then she goes, she's actually more specific, and says she works in intake diversion. The prosecutor absolutely had reason to doubt that she could set that aside, not just for sympathy reasons. So but the prosecutor had the right to not just accept labels of general, you're in law enforcement, and look at the particulars, and decide if a non-racial reason I'm not comfortable with this jurors. You can exercise a peremptory challenge validly, correct? Absolutely, Your Honor. And at the time, the defense only said that there were other jurors, and it was not clear whether the defense was talking about that particular group or the, any juror who has been questioned thus far. At this point, we're up to 43, um, had associations or identified with law enforcement. But law enforcement is such a broad group, and there is no other juror, or prospective juror in this record, that would have been similarly situated but to Casey. when KC. the court is doing the general canvassing, that is to elicit an initial response, and then there's further inquiry to Absolutely, clarify. Your Honor. Yes, but the, juror, the prospective juror that uh, my opponent points to was DL, who said he was a police officer, he was a delegate. That is certainly a significantly different day-to-day uh, -day job than someone whose role day in and day out is to use these extrajudicial factors to determine whether someone should be put through the court so system again, at all. The assessment of the prosecutor that the intake probation officer and the police officer are not the same. And in any event, this is not a juror for a valid reason that you wish to exercise a pre preemptory challenge, then it is valid to do so. Exactly, Your Honor. And so with respect to both CC and KC, there was ample support in the trial record for the, uh, the, the court's findings that these were not pretextual. So then and what, I, what would a, given, given your position on uh, KC, and the comparison to deal. What, what would be any perhaps retort by the defense counsel to show that's pretext? Other than showing, um, let's just say, a white person who also worked for probation was not peremptory. Well, Your Honor, it would matter that if, if you, to use your hypothetical, the white person that they also worked for probation, it would matter what their role was within probation because this juror is really uniquely situated as having worked in intake diversion. That presents unique concerns, and I think the prosecutor and the court both appropriately recognize that as her line so of work. It, so it boils down to the prosecutor perhaps thinking that this particular prospective juror, given the specific nature of their work, right, that, that's what you're focused on, might be defendant friendly? Um, yes, Your Honor. Not probation just... might 
find that interesting, but I, I take it that that's what you're saying. It's, it's actually not just defendant friendly, Your Honor, but it would also be that they would not be a great juror in any criminal case because the job of the jurors is to consider the evidence before them, the evidence presented to them in the courtroom, and someone whose job it is to consider all of these things beyond the courtroom, to determine whether juveniles should even be placed before a judge. That was the juror, those were the jurors' own words. There is significant concern that they would not take into account those other factors at the time they're doing what is supposed to be their job of evaluating the evidence before them. It's, a, it's an odd you? position, I think, to argue, except your point, but it is an odd position to say that someone who works for this kind of department would not follow the instructions of the court, that you only decide this based on what is presented in this courtroom and your findings here. Um, and understand the difference between what goes on there and what goes on in their job at their office at probation. Yes, but the, if, I think your point goes to more that a cause challenge would not have been appropriate for this juror because we could not have established that here. But to the extent the prosecutor had any doubt as to her ability to do that, even if Casey genuinely thought that she could do that. She certainly has respect for the law as a self-identified member of law enforcement, but the fact that the prosecutor has reason to doubt that, she had the right to use that peremptory challenge because this was not a discriminatory. So then the only way to overcome that is someone who is, who, who is not peremptory, who's uh, in probation, a similar if not the exact same position, who does, is not of the same race as the person who is peremptory, it, right, it's not challenged. That, would be, that, that, that is then the only way you're gonna be able to overcome this. I don't know that you could say that that's the only way, Your Honor, because there would have to be, and again, we, we don't have a full record here because of the lack of preservation from the defense. It would depend on what arguments were raised, but none of these were raised, and without those, there's no basis for this court to overturn the findings of the trial court. If the court has no further questions, I'll rely on my brief. Thank Justice you. Justice Pritzker might have had one. I wasn't sure. Just one quick one, thank you. Um, it just doesn't add up to me. This is a juvie probation officer who does diversion. She wants to keep kids out of trouble, okay? She tries. How would she be sympathetic to a grown man that robbed somebody? Well, Your Honor. That makes sense. The idea is it's a pretext, so it may have a little bit of facial validity, but how to, ultimately does it really make sense? Well, Your Honor, it doesn't have to be related to this specific defendant, and Hecker specifically rejected that uh, facts of the case argument saying it was overly restrictive. So it's not that uh, Mr. Wright was a juvenile, that's not the issue, but the fact of working with juveniles, as Justice Troutman pointed out earlier, similar to teachers who may often be struck by prosecutors. What? To Teacher. teachers. Oh. Um, there may be more professions just more inclined to sympathy uh, that would not be suitable jurors in any criminal case. So it's not about being a suitable juror for this defendant, but just that the prosecutor had reason, and not just because of concerns of sympathy, but again, because of her role in what she did every day, her method of analysis in considering those other factors. That's why she had the right to strike that juror. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Your you. Honors. Your Honors, to protect the rights of all New Yorkers, criminal defendants, and just people who want to serve on a jury, their civil duty to serve, we need to be careful not to um, allow prosecutors on appeal now to provide new step two reasons. Um, we should carefully scrutinize the reasons that are provided, and if they are not supported by the record here, it's evidence of pretext, even if one of the reasons may not be under this court's um, determination, especially but wouldn't, but again, wouldn't that depend on what the basis for the other reasons being protectual is? Because if you're saying this reason this juror had, this reason that juror had, this reason another juror had, and reason A is a valid non-protectual reason, can't the people say, well, that in combination with these things is why we struck? If you're saying independently reason B is pretextual for some other reason, sure, I think then you could make that argument. So doesn't it really depend on what the basis for the challenge to that reason is? Because if you're just saying other people had that reason, you know, other people had that and you didn't strike them, but you have a non-protectual reason that in combination with those things makes that non-protectual reason stronger. 
Well, I'm not conceding that any of these reasons are not protectual. I understand. I understand. But um, I think it's based on the view of this case. We just don't have that it was unevenly applied. And the reason why we have this strong record against um, CC and all of his back and forth is because of this unequal questioning of a black juror when you compare it to how they question um, non-African American panelists who fit that criteria. And I believe it's Flowers v. Mississippi who says that this is concerning because it arms prosecutors with like what's happening now with reasons to conceivably have these face neutral reasons for black panelists while choosing to ignore or sort of distort the record on what um, non-African American panelists could could have responded um, in the same way. Um, so that's the problem there, and that's, that's very concerning in this case. But um, I also want to clarify that CC never said he had present-day feeling, uh, present feelings towards the police, um, although the respondent said that. His, uh, I would urge the court to look at the record. He did not say that. Um, and then if I just could briefly point, um, address the show-up point, if your honors have no questions as to Batson. Um, so this is a very short robbery case that involved a disguised perpetrator. Um, he was wearing a red hood, covering all of his hair and hairline, and a mask covering most of all of his face, all the bottom, really what's visible is the eyes. And against this backdrop, we have a suggestive show up. The verdict in this case really hinged on this show up that should have been suppressed. I'll focus on two suggestive factors. One, wearing that non-specific red hoodie. Um, this was a generic description that really the only thing there was that the person was wearing a red hoodie. There was no like specific color of red, no logo. It could have been anyone wearing a red hoodie um, who was also black or, or dark skinned. Um, and both witnesses at the hearing admitted that their identifications were based on the red hoodie itself. Ram Sahoy, who was unable to make an identification both at the hearing and at trial, stated it's not her her identification was not based on the face but quote clothes he was wearing um, and when pressed about the clothes he, she says that's all i remember just wearing a red hoodie guzman also admits that his uh, identification was based on this non-specific hoodie first thing he noticed when he saw mr wright was the hoodie the same red hoodie as in the store and then further tainting Guzman's uh, was the suggestive police remarks in combination with his observations at the scene. So not only does he hear that they stopped a guy at a location, but critically, a police officer in that car says, I think it's the guy. And then they go to that location only to see more suggestive factors. They see a lot of police officers. Thank you. Your, your time okay. is up. Thank you.